everyone and welcome to Rad Chat, the first therapeutic radiographer-led oncology podcast. So this is podcast number 28. Gosh, they're starting to rack up now. Uh, my name is Jane McNamara and I'm joined by my fellow host, Naaman Jilka Anderson. Hello. So Hello. a big thank you to our last guest, Ina Butt, her experience of breast cancer and a work around raising awareness of breast cancer within the Southeast Asian community. If you haven't had a chance yet, please do go and take a listen. It's really good to see her call me out a few times on a few things, so that's really good. Um, I'm sure some of you will take great delight in that. Um, and tonight, we are so pleased to introduce our guest for this evening, so Dr. Sarah Hayward-Small. So she's gonna be discussing a rare and fatal form of cancer called mesothelioma. She's also gonna be talking about her latest research, that may pave the way to diagnose cancer in an earlier stage and also monitor the response to treatment using biomarkers from non-invasive methods such as breath analysis. So as a biology geek, I'm really pleased to have you on, Sarah. And I know I've listened to you previously and I'm always on the edge of my seat listening to every word you say. So I'm so excited for our audience to be able to listen to you tonight. Oh, thank you so much, Joe. Thank you so much for inviting me tonight. I'm very excited. Um, it's January, it's a fresh start, so it does feel like a good time to do something new. And this is my third podcast, first podcast. I was going to say, oh, you're, a, you're an experienced member with three. <laughs> It's the first, yeah, so it's the first one, so I am very um, appreciative of, of, of give, getting this time today. Thank you so much, everyone. Aww. So, Sarah, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm a noble Sheffield girl, really, born and bred, as they say. True Yorkshire standard, and um, I'm from. So I'm from Sheffield, um, and it, it's a classic tale of having to um, go away to university, travel around a bit, and then end up back on your own doorstep, really. <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, so I'm, fr I'm from Sheffield. Um, first person in my family to go to university, um, so I do really feel as though I'm, I've got complete imposter syndrome. But I've always been driven to understand things. I can remember when I was little, I uh, wanted to know why um, hairs went grey. And now I'm in my 40s, I kind of know that it happens to the best of us. Um, but I've always had that inquisitive mind. Um, and, I, and I've always liked working with people. Um, so Sarah, I want you to I tell to... me why hairs go grey. <laughs> I did, I did I did look into this I did look into this and I think it's to do with the kind of the you know the, the natural aging process it could be to do with the proteins that you have you know the the makeup that you've got really um, but yeah so it's a sign of maturity I think and something to be welcomed uh, like a good wine <laughs> it gets better with age but absolutely but my curiosity with the human body um, I always kind of knew that I wanted to work with uh, different diseases. Um, and so I kind of, my, I've got a confession to make. Um, my first degree was in chemistry. Yes. So if anyone likes watching the Big Bang and things like that, I wasn't quite like Sheldon. Okay. <laughs> Um, but uh, I do love thinking about things on a really small scale, you know, kind of the elements, you know, all the different atoms. Um, because I think if we can understand the small pieces, it helps us to put the bigger picture together, a bit like pixels. Um, so, um, but when I was a chemist, I kind of realized very quickly that I wanted to make drugs to, to help people with cancer. So that's where that started. Um, and then... Um, I wanted to say this to all the students out there. I wanted to do a PhD in cancer studies. Um, and some people at the time told me I couldn't do that because I was a chemist. So I did it anyway. There you go, you, pr you proved them wrong. <laughs> To everybody, everybody, you know, yeah. when you've done your first degree and, and when you're thinking about, you can change careers. And I'm sure you've seen this now, Man and Joe. You, you can change careers. And, and sometimes with the best of, um, you know, advice, sometimes you do have to really go for it and trust your own instincts. Take advice. Um, but but definitely, I mean, it's the best, best decision. I, I just kind of thought, well, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and I think a few of us have done that in our careers. Um, and... I've loved it. I've loved it. Absolutely. Um, I, I must admit, though, it's been a, an uphill struggle 
because I, I came to Sheffield to do my PhD and it was in neuroblastoma, which you might have heard about. It's paediatric cancer. And um, I didn't know anything about cancer at all. Or I, d I didn't study cell biology or anything at that time. Um, so I went along to lectures that medical students were going. I tagged along. I was, I was quite... Um, I was saying I did have a social life, but I did used to like to go to different lectures as well and just embrace the university life. I think that's great. You'd have loved all this DL then, that. wouldn't you, Sarah? Yeah. As a as a oh, student, yeah, yeah. you'd have been on le everything. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We, we can do that now, can't we? So so Joe, we we watched each other teach, and and we can do it from the the comfort of our own. Um, kind of homes as well it's amazing I've watched so many different things um, but yeah so I, I did kind of teach myself um, kind of cell biology cancer biology anatomy physiology all the ologies but I, I think what struck me is back when I was 20 21 I, I kind of thought well I think we've got cancer kind of organized haven't we yeah and we kind of have and we haven't and then that pulled me in even further because um, people say the word cancer and it's 200 different diseases, isn't it? And you've got complexity and even just looking back through your podcast when you've looked at prostate or breast cancer, and I'm sure your listeners are very aware that even within one cancer, you get great variation, don't you? Great variation. And we're only at the tip of the iceberg. Um, so that's where my research goes in, really, is trying to understand the complexity of cancer on a small level but I'm really excited because I'm just on the verge really of changing again <laughs> despite some advice as well and to try and maybe start branching out into more clinical situations to see if my laboratory observations hold true in what we call the real world you know people that you work with every day so it's quite an exciting time really <laughs> Yeah, it sounds it. Um, a lot of bouncing around and lots of different skills you probably picked up. Um, <laughs> it's nice to see, I'd say. I know you talked about your PhD in neuroblastoma. What did you actually look at? For my PhD, um, it was kind of, it was um, biomarkers, really. So, you know, in terms of on, on individual cells, I always try and visualize them as having like little barcodes, like what you scan and things like that. And so trying to look at um, different markers, you know, which you could take, you know, blood markers or actually on the cancer itself, um, a, a sign that says I'm cancer, you know, I've changed, I've transformed. And if you can detect that earlier, then, then that's a good thing um, before it can spread. Um, so my PhD involved um, looking at um, tumours and, and working out um, a panel of biomarkers that could um, differentiate children into different groups and then based on that according to therapy because you've got to get the right treatment to the right person at the right time. Um, I'm sure you guys have experience of that and it's, it's a bit like what I call Goldilocks. You don't want to give too much treatment and too little. You've got to hit that sweet spot, haven't you? Yeah. So you don't want to cause too much damage. So a lot of my work was on biomarkers um, in neuroblastoma as well. Um, I treated cells with um, chemotherapy drugs. So I did a lot of work with drugs such as cyclophosphamide, etoposide and things like that. And I looked at the cellular response to those drugs. That sounds amazing. So did you come across any radiotherapy? Did you kind of have, had you had knowledge of how we use radiotherapy to treat cancer previously? Or was this again, another learning curve of, oh my gosh, there's a linear accelerator. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, it So, so I, my, oh, a lot of my work is chemotherapy based. Um, but as a PhD student, one of my, um, one of my many trips, my um, kind of the lectures that I used to get crash. I used to go to um, Barry Hancock's lectures and things like that. Going back a few years now, I'm showing sure my age, but um, used to go to Western Park Hospital. And one of the, um, he took me around um, the equipment there and and the facilities, and it's just amazing. It's amazing, and how you can pinpoint things exactly. I just think that's wonderful. Um, that's what we want to do, isn't it? I've, a lot of my research involves new drugs that can pinpoint tumour margins as well, you know, with photodiagnosis where you light the tumour up, you can turn the light off, you can light it up, 
you know when the, when you see it and it's I just think that's amazing really um and I think sometimes you have to combine therapies don't you yeah yeah absolutely and I think as well just thinking from that biological perspective and cellular level it's really interesting for us as therapeutic radiographers because we obviously get taught about cellular response we talk a lot about radiobiology but it's using that skill and knowledge to actually then put into the care and support that we offer our patients and I always marveled at that you know in terms of you know at what dose you, your patients are going to experience certain side effects and to be able to anticipate that so you know the work that you're doing in a lab to then translate that and I think it's amazing the thought of you being able to go into the like the clinical side of things because you will really see the impact of the work that you get to do in the lab so Sarah, I know you've done work around mesothelioma. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, so I think I've worked on different cancers. So I moved on from neuroblastoma, then I worked in Leeds and I worked on cervical cancer. And then back at Sheffield, I worked on breast cancer for a little bit. Um, and now my current position um, in, at Sheffield Hallam as a senior lecturer I've worked on different cancers leukemia lymphoma prostate cancer and to some extent um, what I've worked on um, was very much dependent on uh, funding available okay and, and and with the the common cancers there are a lot of, there's lots of funding available it's still hard <laughs> but there's lots of money there um, and then one thing that kind of I became involved with is um, I decided that there's different cancers and there's a lot of people working on breast cancer and prostate cancer etc so I thought well I'll go for one of the what's what's been described as one of the deadliest cancers I want to go for something that's considered to be incurable something with a poor prognosis so that was the first decision and then I thought I want to go for one which which is preventable you know figures vary but roughly you know they say up to maybe 40 percent of cancers are preventable so i wanted to go for one so a mesothelioma just hits that category so i made that strategic decision again against advice uh, in 2017 <laughs> i thought i'll work on mesothelioma and a lot of people said oh a lot of people said it's very rare okay okay it's aggressive and it's fatal but it's very rare um, are you sure you, you'll be able to, to kind of conduct research in this area? And uh, it's, it's been very hard um, to, to gain funding, I will be honest with that. Um, but my home institution have, have thankfully supported me. And now I've got um, four PhD students, I have project students, I have MRes students. And we are a small but mighty group based here in Sheffield. Uh, which is the northern powerhouse <laughs> and um, because it, 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 it rhymes true as well because with mesothelioma a lot of um, cases are um, wrapped up with occupational exposure to asbestos which I'm hoping that some people might have heard of it's a fire retardant that's in buildings if the buildings um, um, were put together before the year 2000 I think in the UK um, it will have asbestos in there it's really scary though uh, Joe and Naaman when when you look back historically um, asbestos was used in in clothing of firefighters because it's fire retardant and a lot of firefighters have got mesothelioma in fact um, you know um, but thinking back to the horrible events that occurred at 9-11 people a lot of people had mesothelioma after that when there's been a big event like that with dust and everything and it's not just um, i'm trying to raise awareness really because it's not just um um plumbers you know it's people in the armed forces it's in a lot of school buildings you know it's it's very likely that we will come across this and we have a list of um dangerous fibers uh, but my kind of instinct, my kind of one of my research areas is I'm thinking there's quite a lot of things that are legal at the moment in the UK that still might hold the same yeah. um, properties. So because not every case of mesothelioma has occupational exposure. So there's that question mark there about 
what causes it and things like that. So it's really important to get to the bottom of this. What sort of things might still have it in them? Um, I know Absolutely. it can take 20 to 50 years to develop. So you might have a small exposure, but it yeah, can take a long, yes, long time absolutely. for it to really be There's been things well, that have been it? described even in crafting kits, little crystals, even healing crystals. Um, when I started to work in this area, again, it was difficult because I couldn't get any asbestos because it's so dangerous. And I had to work with health and safety companies to try and uh, do this under um, confined conditions. Um, but then a student that was working for me at the time actually found some asbestos on um, an online uh, company that everybody seems to use, beginning with A. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's slightly scary, just buy it off the internet. Yeah. Sarah, yeah, you could have come around my house though whilst I was having it renovated, you could have had a lot of asbestos. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, that's right. And so, yeah. Um, but the, the thing is, as well, one of one of my main research areas is it's so difficult to find these fibers. And, and what happens if you get them in the body and then they clear clear away? The damage is done and they've gone. So they might not be there, but they've caused the damage. So that's that's my other concern with the research around that. Um, but f for the first time, we've our group have published. Um, I used my chemistry background and what I thought was, well, these fibres, they're made up of um, different elements and we can look at these elements in the lab and we can, again, we can light them up. And we've published a paper called Needle in a Haystack, just like the song. And uh, and what, what we can do is actually find these asbestos fibres at levels which a pathologist may not be able to see, may not. So we're actually, the more you look, the more you find. You often find this, don't you? <laughs> Sarah, are you really conscious, just with knowing so much about carcinogens and what can potentially go on to develop cancer? Are, are you like a health expert in terms of, I'm not going near this, I'm not touching that? Does it, does it affect your day-to-day -day life, knowing that amount about carcinogenic materials? I think I think the honest answer to that, Joe, is yes and no. Um, so it's like when I teach about um, um, kind of how to prevent um, diseases and prevent certain cancers through diet. You know, going back to um, the conversation that we had off air about pizza versus broccoli, for example. Um, and I always find that I'm really healthy. I'm really healthy for those few days when I kind of look at the recent data and put that together for for. Um, but I soon slip into bad habits again. Um, and but it, it it is it does make you aware. It does make you aware. But you have to balance that, don't you? And I think you could probably relate to this about what you know. You've got to rationalise it and think it in terms of probability as well. That people are exposed to things, but then they're okay. You know. So there's this nature versus nurture argument, really. It oh, does yes. sound like you seem to go against a lot of the advice, Sarah, from what you've said. <laughs> well, you've, you've got to forge your own Seems path have got you quite these far, things, though. haven't you, really? Otherwise, you're repeating things. That's what I always think. Yeah. I, th I think with some of the niche areas as yeah. well, many people won't want to go into research into it because there isn't many outputs. That's just from my experience. Some of the bigger cancers, they might call them the sexier ones because there's more research, there's more funding. But this sort that's of stuff right, is really important right. because well, well how I look at it as well is so. if if you if you do work in these um, niche areas, you know you, every effort is 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 needed. Every effort's rewarded. It is rewarding. Um, it is rewarding um, to to be part of that. Um, but anything that I find in mesothelioma could potentially be translated to other cancers. Yeah, other thoracic cancers. That's what I always it's, you know lung cancer. So. One of the main things that um, that we've been getting really excited about in the last few years is um, um, working with patients and focus groups. Um, so important, so important. Um, and I, sometimes I've been sat in tears with the patients just going through everything. And I said, what do you really want me to work on? What can we work on? And everybody said unanimously, 
we want to test earlier. We want to find our cancers earlier so it gives us a better chance. We want better screening. And so that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to get new diagnostic methods that are earlier. And instead of being invasive, um, we're going to take a leaf out of one of my favourite things on the earth, which is dogs. I love dogs and I've always been fascinated with sniffer dogs. I've just got a beagle who's seven months old. Um, and I am interested um, in breathomics, am interested. which is basically from breath. You can monitor changes in the body, potentially detect cancer. Dogs can do it. Hopefully we can too. Hopefully we can too. I've seen it on, I can't remember which film I watched over Christmas, I watched a lot, but they, they were doing that and the, the dogs smell the breath and then they put their paws over, don't they? And they're like, I yeah. know, it's wonderful. I it's love wonderful. it. It's amazing. It's amazing. But it's, it's true. As things start to change in the body, um, the metabolism changes and that can manifest in what you breathe out. Um, the, the other thing is, though, that in breath, you do have a lot of biomarkers. You're talking maybe a thousand. Yeah, <laughs> so I was going to say, how complex is it? <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but then you, you look at those markers in an unbiased way, and then you can also look at them from a strategic point of view and think, well, what would I expect to be different in cancer? So there's different ways you can look at them. Um, and you can find new ones that we don't even know where they come from yet. So it's really exciting. And I think in relation to 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 um, your line of work as well, Joe and Nema, is not only can you use breath to diagnose diseases such as cancer, uh, we're looking into it at the moment. It's not just me, it's a big push uh, that's internationally um, around the world. There's big task forces at the moment. But um, you can also use it to monitor how treatment's going with patients. And the thing is, because it's non-invasive, you know, if people are happy to take, just like a roadside breath test, really, but, you know, something simple like that point of care device. Um, and it might help give you like a general health health screen and, and, and things like that and help you monitor your response to treatment. It's, it's really exciting where it's going. How would that work? So would it be you'd get like a baseline assessment? Yep. So that's what some research has, has been after every uh, appointment or every fraction. Done, published research in the last few years, I think from Loughborough University, a little trial involving 62 patients. Um, and they kind of, I think after radiotherapy, they, they monitored their breath. It's almost like a signature, almost like um, um, a gaseous fingerprint. <laughs> Um, and uh, you can monitor that. Uh, you do get a lot of information and a lot of the output. We might not un fully understand the implications, um, but you do also get different biomarkers that you know correspond with treatment and how it's going, really. It's quite an exciting time. Yeah. I suppose for the area as well, it's like a non-invasive yeah. technique um so for most respiratory things as well they can be quite invasive can't they with the biopsy and stuff like that so um yeah so it's very interesting i'm gonna be honest i don't know much about it it's yeah i was trying to read up on, on lots of things <laughs> lots of very long chemistry symbols and words yeah. and i remember how much i so didn't enjoy chemistry yeah. at uni. sarah in terms well, school, of kind so. of what you're doing at the moment <laughs> are you are you working on lots of different individual projects and are you overseeing things or what what does a day in the life of Sarah look like? <laughs> Probably involves a, a barking dog and screeching kids really <laughs> frantically <laughs> looking for cornflakes yeah um, so yeah I mean I kind of I, I mostly uh, teach um, the majority of my job is teaching um, have a, a look after a cancer biology course which I absolutely love um, because it's so great to, to watch students kind of try and grapple with the same concepts and and, and they're the future <laughs> you know when I retire then um, hopefully they can crack on and do a better job than me I'm sure they will um, so teaching is, a, is, is it takes a lot of my day as well um, it's 
really hard to do research when you've got a full teaching portfolio. I'm sure everybody can relate to that. Um, but it's a good job I'm a night owl as well. So, you know, I, I do like to, to kind of put my full efforts into things. Um, but I also do a lot of active research. I review papers, I write grants. I've got my research group as well. Um, but I'm very fortunate to have a job where I've almost got a bit of overlap. You know, the two Venn, the Venn diagram kind of mixes together. And the, the key thing is that um, I get to teach about um, cancer, um, the main changes, and look to the future. It's um, So that's how a typical day um, is like, really. Lots of teaching, um, both classroom and Zoom at the moment. <laughs> So Sarah, with all the work that you've been doing and the knowledge and expertise that you've got, what are the big changes that you anticipate in the next five, ten years around cancer care, maybe some of the treatments and things that you've been looking at specifically? Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, everything's becoming more tailored, isn't it, towards personalised medicine. So I think that's the first thing. You know, every cancer patient is different. Every service user is different. Um for example, when I was a PhD student, they said there was about four different types of neuroblastoma. And I think I found about eight just from me, my research as well, if we wanted to really divide it up. So kind of patient responsive and patient stratification is important. We need to know. It's about predictions as well, about if somebody will respond to treatment. I think that's important, which kind of ties into personalized therapy a little bit as well. We don't want to give people um, treatment um, that can have side effects both from chemotherapy and radiotherapy if it's not going to be of benefit to them you know it's a classic risk versus benefit thing but um, in terms of where that's going I think it's not just that cancer can vary from patient to patient cancer varies within the patient as well so that's one of the key things as well and what we call um, the tumour microenvironment, which is essentially like a little map of whatever's happening with the tumour. And you've got different patches. Even if you walk, if you were to walk across a tumour, it would be different as you go from north to south. And it's it's difficult, isn't it? It's difficult because you know you, you want if you if you home in too close, like what I was saying earlier, if you look at the cellular events too closely, you don't see the bigger picture. So I think in terms of the, the next advances, it's to really understand a person's tumour and the kind of variability across that one person, but also looking across. So it, it's a lot of genomic information coming across, hopefully breathomics, um, big data, like we normally say omics, you know, that can help predict certain responses. Yeah. With the breathomics, um, Sarah, so when you're talking about it being exhaled, the different tumour markers, obviously knowing which ones are coming out, that would be very beneficial. But when the treat, so say, for example, radiotherapy or even chemo radiation at the same time, would you find there'd yes, be like a can, reduction in the ex um, exhalation in our, in of some of the markers we've, or would it go up as well? What we've managed to do with our research vary? at Hallam is it's almost like a breath biopsy. Um, do you know kind of the pathologist will tell you what type of uh, cell it is or what kind of tumour type it is or it's it's to do with what type of mesothelioma really the phenotype of it um, instead of a pathologist looking down our VOC profiles track across to that our profiles track across by VOX um, I call it I call it a VOX box actually that's my trademark name um, VOX box VOX a VOC, volatile organic compound. It's just the compounds that come off. And box because it rhymes with it. <laughs> Rather than saying biopsy. Um, but but we, can, we, can tell, uh, we can tell what type of mesothelioma it is from the breath. So if you take that, that case and then track it, and what we're doing at the moment, our experiments, is we're doing different things in a 3D cell culture system. Yep. So it's like all in vitro. Um, but what we're trying to do is trying to simulate what would happen during the development of cancer. And we're looking how VOC profiles change. So that's what we're trying to do. So that's a really good question 
No man, because we're really trying to work out because some markers go up and some go down. Yeah. So it's wonderful. You can see the whole picture. It's like fishing with a thousand rods. Okay. But of course, I love animals, so I would throw the fish back. But um, you get the idea. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm a member of the British Society of Immunology. Immunotherapy, I should wear that, that hat. I've got like a t-shirt that says supercells on it. I love anything to do with immunology. It's hard not to, isn't it? It's hard not to. And I immunotherapy. <laughs> I don't. I made it myself, which is pretty sad. Um, that's true. <laughs> But uh, I, love that you have a anything, I mean, <laughs> the whole world seems to be an immunologist at the moment, so it's, it's great for that. But the immune system's like a big family, isn't it? There's all different family members. I mean, I think everybody knows what a B cell and T cell is now. Yes. Exciting, Exciting times. And, and all those, they respond differently. And going back to what we were talking about earlier, do you know when I said I use my PhD to kill cancer um, by using chemotherapy? And what I found out is sometimes it's really hard to kill every single cancer cell. That's the first thing. So you've got ones that left behind. And then the other thing was you can be quite clever about it because cells die in different ways. And then that can affect the immune response. So if you go for an immune response that if you go for a cell death response that can activate the immune system, it switches it on. And then the immune system can do the job which it's supposed to do, which is target abnormal cells. So maybe treatments need to work with our normal mechanisms, which immunotherapy tries to do, really. Yeah. So it's exciting times. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, it's using something that's already there, which is. I love body. it. So I love the fact that we're going to have all these geeky students now looking into some of their <laughs> cellular it's responses. Really, really and I love it, Sarah, for the fact that I teach obviously cellular level um, radiobiology and things like that. And I love the fact that this podcast is going to encourage them to go and do some additional reading. Um, but Sarah, for those who are kind of looking at going into research or potentially looking at those fields and I, I certainly know um, graduates who qualified as diagnostic or therapeutic radiographers that have got PhDs and look, working in other areas or have gone to work predominantly in a lab rather than going and working within the clinical setting you know what hints and tips would you get give to people maybe considering changing their original idea of becoming an allied health profession or a healthcare professional you know what advice would you give them i i, th I think if you've got a natural curiosity whereas as human beings we do have that and if you've got that drive you need to feed that ambition and i think um some people might put you off because you might be good at your job and they want you to stay on this one job and stay on that trajectory but um you know, you know, it's the definition of madness, isn't it? To keep doing the same thing, to, um, you know, and expect different results. So try it, even if it's a temporary thing. You know, it's it's good if you can get that support there um, and you can be clever how you can try and find ways in which your job can overlap the research. So, you know, I've, I've got a D, D um, prof student at the moment. So she she's also working in the NHS and doing a... Um, kind of a PhD in the in the spare time you know all this spare time that we have at the moment um, but but you, you can make it work and I think it goes back to one of your previous podcasts about time management but my hints and tips would be um, to try and upskill the best you can even if it's for half an hour a week in your lunch hour there is a number of online webinars online conferences that you can attend from the luxury of your own desk so have a look at the conferences, have a look at the webinars and don't be frightened to reach out to academics and, and other researchers. And I always get nervous before I approach someone and Joe, we got in touch through Twitter, didn't we? Even though, you know, we work, you know, in They're similar to the same institutions. institutions. But, but I think you've always, always got, got to reach out, out because in the most, most cases, cases, people have always been really, really, really helpful. And you can almost triangulate, I like to use that word, 
whatever you want to do onto other things. It might be that somebody's doing a clinical trial, you have an idea, and it could just be um, some kind of amendment and things like that, or you know, you need to talk to these people and get these conversations going. So, you know, you need, you need to go for it really, but I think just test the water with the online resources. And don't be frightened to make a change. Sounds like um, something out of a song that. <laughs> don't worry, I'm not going to start singing. <laughs> but it is true. But that, that's what motivates me. I, I'm like a chameleon. I like to change quite a lot. It keeps keeps me um, keeps me fresh, as they say. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it benefits the people that you teach and educate as well, because you've got lots of experience in lots of different areas. And I know from listening to your lectures, you've got so much skill and knowledge in lots of different areas. You'll just come out with pieces of information. And I'm like, how does she know this? <laughs> so being a chameleon is really good. Really good. So thank you, Sarah. Um, honestly, it's always lovely to listen to you talk about your work because you can tell how passionate you are, but you really do kind of just glaze over it. So, oh yeah, I just <laughs> help cure cancer from a cellular level. Um, and it is really actually pretty amazing what you get to do. And it's great to also get acknowledgement for the different professions that contribute towards cancer care. I think sometimes, um, even Naaman and I get hung up on being a therapeutic radiographer and going, you know, nobody knows who we are. And yet actually there are thousands upon thousands of other people, again, in the background doing lots of, you know, really amazing work to help cure cancer. Um, and it's, it's really good to be able to acknowledge that. So thank you. Hey, so. Can I ask you a very quick question? This might sound like a silly question, but when you're working in the lab, how do you get the cancer cells to test on? Sarah, can I ask yeah, you a very it's, quick it's question? The, oh, this might sound like a silly question, this, but when you're working in the lab, oh, it's how amazing. do you get the cancer cells <laughs> just, 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 to the test on? Well. <laughs> oh. Yes. Do, <laughs> it's amazing. I love to do this on open days, actually. Um, <laughs> Sorry, have you got a t-shirt for this as well? So, <laughs> the cancers that we use were taken from patients. Okay, and some of the cancers were taken from patients in the 1960s, the 1950s, and they're still growing. Okay. Oh my gosh! You take so well. it's sim it's simple. You just take take a little bit of tissue. You put it into um, it's it's called media. It's just a solution. It's like fluid with all the nutrients in, and. It goes, it goes through a, through a like a catastrophe. catastrophe. Oh, oh, like what we're going to do, and 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 it gains the gift of immortality. So, so the, some, my, the, the cell lines that I used, used for my PhD, they were older than me. Oh wow! <laughs> and I'm quite old. But the, you know, like they developed the polio vaccine with it. You know, years and years ago, it's been around. Now there is some controversy. If anyone's interested, have a look at the story of Hela. Henrietta Lacks about how those cells were taken from a patient and there is there's a, a big question mark around the ethics and consent for that you know it's it's so interesting um about the areas but but those cells are still going Naaman um yeah so it, they just grow in um in plastic flasks yep I'm so glad you asked that question because that's an amazing question. It's a really good question, and I, and I know kind of I could. That's I, amazing. I'm not saying it, yeah, but I, can I wasn't kind expecting that answer. Tune into what you're thinking now, but you think to be honest, is it really is it really similar to what we see as real cancer? And and the, and the answer is it's caricature. It's the model. Um, but what we tr this is what I'm trying to do really is everybody is trying to whatever we see in the cell lines in in the lab. We always try and see if we see the same markers in patients, and that's the key thing. Yeah, because it's a good model to manipulate. Um, so we have to keep. Yeah. Sorry, Nim. To compare, say, tumor cells from the 1960s to, say, a patient more recently, I suppose there'd be some quite a few different genetic traits now. I suppose. There, there, you do sorry, get differences. Would you be able to compare, you do get differences, say, but you just a famous pathologist said to me, and I remember this. It inspired me. Some, quite a few different and he said, to, traits now, "That's his way to go forward, Sarah, is to go backwards." <laughs> <laughs> and and he and he said, within any archives of the hospital or anything, there's biopsies, there's there's, there's bits of tumours embedded in wax, I love candles, you know, going back. 
hundred hundred years. Yeah, and it's all there in the archives. So you don't necessarily have to go forward, you can go back. And sometimes when you go back, you see that it's the answer's always been there. Yeah. We just didn't see it. We just didn't see it. And that's what I love re about research, really. So if you are struggling, <laughs> you can always go back through the literature and look at other people's data and pull that together. Yeah. Oh, Sarah, thank you. Honestly, it's been amazing and really insightful. So your hosts today have been myself, Jay McNamara, and Naaman Jolka Anderson. A huge thank you again to our guest, Dr. Sarah Hayward-Small. So head over to YouTube page if you want to have a look at the recording. And if you're utilising this podcast for CPD purposes, please consider the reflective questions posted along with the podcast. And to receive your accredited CPD digital badge, please complete the Google form linked with the podcast. So our next guest to feature will be Jemima Reynolds, who will be discussing her role at the charity Trekstock. So thank you, everyone, and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.